Is Scott short for anything? Scott Trick. Did you say did you say Scott Trick? That'd be amazing yeah, it's Scott Trick. <laughs> It's certainly not. <laughs> well, now I will, I will obviously only be calling you Scott. That's right. You would not be the first. <laughs> Can you actually, I think we should call it the, sh- the short for Scott trick edition and just have that be our B-roll. That's awesome. There we go. There we go. There we go. <laughs> the It's short for Scott trick edition. <laughs> Hello, everyone, and welcome to Rational Security 2.0. I am one of your co-hosts, Scott R. Anderson. I'm thrilled to be here with my two other co-hosts, Quinta Jurassic. Hello. And Alan Rosenstein. Hello, hello. And we are very excited to have you here today for what we are calling the It's Short for Scott Trick edition because of a little confusion <laughs> over my first name. It should be Scott Trick. I don't care if it's not Scott Trick. It, it should, this is, it's a too good to check kind of fact. What, what did you think it could be short for when you <laughs> asked Prescott. me? Prescott. It could have been Prescott. It could have Scott-a-thin. been Prescott. <laughs> but but to, shorten it, to shorten it from Prescott, wouldn't you be only taking away three letters and then adding one more letter at the end? Does Prescott usually have two T's at the end? I feel That's like it true. Doesn't. But to be clear, WWW is short for World Wide Web and has like three times the number of syllables. So people do weird yeah. things. Yeah, fair point. Fair point. All right. Well, you know, maybe we'll I'll forgive you that you this one. Also, it's not short for Prescott, as we just established. It's short for Scott Trick. <laughs> Scott Trick, exactly. <laughs> Scott Scottrick Bartholomew Anderson. That is my full name. <laughs> oh, uh, very syllable to my father's name and his father's name before him. Uh, and with that, uh, I I will say I will forgive you this transgression because I am excited to have you here in spite of not knowing my real first name uh, to talk over some of the week's big national security news. First up for this week, our first topic, Jake, Mr. Sullivan, if you're NSST. <laughs> The Biden administration finally unveiled its long-awaited and long-overdue National Security Strategy, or NSS, last week through a high-profile event at Georgetown University featuring none other than National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan. Does it hit the mark, and does it even matter? Topic two, big subpoena energy. The January 6th committee confidently closed its last live session with a bang last week in the form of a unanimous vote to subpoena former President Trump for his testimony. Trump responded with a 14-page rant a few days later that repeated many of his grievances over the 2020 election but did not address whether he would comply. Why did the committee take this step? Is there any way to compel Trump to cooperate? And will it need to? And topic three, our most controversial topic ever. Is it SIGINT or SIGINT? How would you all say this? Hard G, soft G? I, I say SIGINT. Because it signals it's, it's too. But you say GIF or GIF? No, no, it, no, no, no. It's like, Alan, no, it's actually signals today. intelligence. Not today, yeah. Satan. <laughs> it's signals, yes. It's, yes, it's, it's it signals intelligence. You know, it's SIGIN, it signals intelligence. But it's a graphic interface F, whatever the F stands for well, in GIF. Yeah. <laughs> Format. That's what I'm saying. This is the topic that's going to tear rational security apart. Finally, we found it. But we're not actually talking about that. We are talking about the fact the Biden administration has issued a new executive order limiting its collection of signals or signals intelligence (laughs) (laughs) as part of an effort to come to agreement with the European Union's legal system and its stringent privacy protections. Will these new arrangements be invalidated by European courts like their two predecessors, or could they finally be up to snuff? For our first topic, Alan, let me hand it over to you to get us started. So as Scott mentioned, last week, the White House released its official national security strategy. This is the document that outlines the administration's vision of national security and what its intended priorities are over the next several years. Uh, National security strategy is something that every administration releases, usually kind of near the beginning of its term. It's always a high profile event in D.C., and, and this was no exception. But and here's my first question for you, Scott, as our resident foreign policy person. What does a national security strategy actually do? And are they important? I mean, we've had a bunch of them, right? This is the first Biden one, but there was a Trump one and an Obama one and a Bush one. What is their purpose? So uh, it's a really good question. Uh, And to find out the answer, we would have to ask Congress. Uh, A long time ago, uh, in the current iteration, the Goldwater-Nichols bill, which was, I think, in the late 1980s, if I'm recalling, 1987, I want to say, was what it was enacted. It essentially has been a longstanding statutory requirement that requires each presidential 
administration to issue one of these documents. And it's part of kind of a constellation of documents. There's also a national defense strategy, increasingly more in more recent years, although for a number of years now, there's been a related nuclear strategy. And the idea is to kind of force both force the administration to engage in a kind of reasoning process to say, hey, let's think through and force ourselves to articulate like what, how we're approaching certain problems here. This is probably the most generous take on it. And then communicate to Congress. And the idea is there's supposed to be a little bit of a back and forth and a dialogue there. There's not much of a dialogue now that I can tell, and certainly in any of the contemporary ones of these that have been written, they tend to be much more of an announcement by the administration. And different administrations use them kind of differently. For a lot of them, it's kind of a box checking exercise. They say, okay, we need to say something. Uh, we're going to have to give something to Congress. Let's pull together a pretty vanilla document in a lot of cases that covers a lot of things we want to get to, maybe signals some departures from the prior administration if they were of a different party or a different orientation on a particular issue set in a meaningful way. So there's a little bit of a political signaling act there. Sometimes they're used to roll out really significant policy change. The most classic example of this is probably the 2002 national security strategy, which is where the second Bush administration ruled out the idea that U.S. Well, the United States was embracing kind of preemptive self-defense as a national security strategy, which kind of prefaced the eventual invasion of Iraq uh, and a lot of other military action, although maybe less action than people think it did. By the time, we thought it was going to anticipate a lot of U.S. intervention around the world with a kind of aggressive, forward-leaning military strategy after the 9-11 attacks. So it can serve a lot of different strategic purposes in the same way any sort of public-facing document or presentation can. And it really depends on what the administration wants to do with it. Internally, like I said, it is a good conversation forcing exercise. This is the way I think a lot of political scientists and policy people justify it. I'm less convinced that it's always really useful for forcing those conversations or, or forces reconciliation. A lot of times you just see these things become very weighty, long documents that have kind of long laundry lists of issues that are kind of loosely reconciled without any of the real wrestling with trade-offs and implications that you would actually need if you were to say, okay, well, how are we going to prioritize these different sometimes intention goals and interests the United States have, things like that. Um, so you rarely, rarely see that in many of these. But you know, it does have a little bit of that kind of driving conversation among force them to get their ducks in a row. And early in administration, that can be useful because national security policy is often very reactive. Um, you are responding to global changes, the developments of the world that's been very true, the Biden administration that's faced a pretty unprecedented set of international crises, a lot of which went in directions they did not anticipate from Afghanistan to Ukraine to the pandemic to you know global econ economic issues. So uh, maybe there's an argument to forcing people to step back a little bit. This particular document, I'll say, I don't find it to be super useful or interesting because I don't seem to be doing much with it. It's not really, it doesn't really add a lot more to what they released in the middle of 2021 as their interim national security strategy, which kind of signaled a clear departure, although some interesting points of continuity with the Trump administration. So basically, what I would say is at the top level, they are saying, hey, we embrace and kind of accept the Trump administration orientation to a more competitive global system. Um, this was a kind of notable development of the Trump administration policy in 2017, where they basically said, hey, we're not going to talk about you know the international system and just address addressing transnational threats, which was kind of the post 9-11 norm. We're going to acknowledge up front, we're in co a competitive relationship with Russia and China. And the Biden administration has kept that in place. At the same time, they have pivoted back towards a real focus on international cooperation, coordination, and global order as sources of strength for the United States in combating and pushing it back against what it frames as Russian aggression and Chinese something one step short of aggression, but a very forward-leaning foreign policy um, that's often perceived as aggressive, certainly by, by neighbors in Asia. And so for that reason, it, it's interesting in that highlighting those points of continuity, we can get into some more details about certain points it pulls out that's a little interesting. But uh, it really, in a lot of ways, it, it is an effort to take what they had already framed last year about saying, hey, you know, these are the points of continuity and points of departure and the way we're kind of spinning what's already there. And just elaborates with some more details uh, in a way that has little little bits, but nothing I don't think particularly earth shattering. So so let's let's get into the the details of this one. It, it seems to be kind of divided into two broad buckets, right? One is great power competition or near peer competition with China as the main long term threat and Russia as, for obvious reasons, the main short term threat. And then on the other side, you have 
the Biden administration trying to think about how to grapple with long-term transnational issues, whether it's climate change or pandemics or migration or a million other things. So I want to start with the the China the China Russia stuff. So is there anything either new in this document or at the very least non obvious with respect to China and Russia, which is to say, can, is there anyone that can credibly stand up and say, ah, the Biden administration is choosing to frame China and Russia as near peer antagonists? You know, they could have framed it differently, but, you know, we're seeing a particularly aggressive choice here. Or is it the case that reality is what it is? And they're just making the obvious point that Russia and China are currently in an antagonistic posture, and therefore to not write that down in the national security strategy would be delusional. Yeah, I mean, look, I do I do share some of Scott's general feeling about the uncertain usefulness of these kinds of documents. I mean, so much of it, reading through it, you read it, and it seems like, yeah, like, the sky, I, I agree, the sky is blue, right? You know, this this problem, that is a problem. Someone should do something about that, right? But, you know, it's a 50-page document. You can't get into all of the the details and nuances there. I do think there was a an interesting New York Times write-up of the strategy by David Sanger on, looks like, October 12th, where it gets to, I think, some of the strangenesses of thinking about Russia and China right now, where uh, I'll just read the paragraph. Uh, Mr. Biden made clear that over the long term, he was more worried about China's moves to, quote, layer authoritarian governance with a revisionist foreign policy, end quote, than he was about a declining, battered Russia. More than six months after the invasion of Ukraine, the Russian military appears less fearsome than it did when the first drafts of the documents circulated in the White House in December. So that struck me as interesting because we're sort of in this situation where, as Sanger writes, you know, Russia seems a lot less fearsome now than it did before the war in Ukraine insofar as the military, I mean, it's just been route after route after route. And yet at the same time, it also seems, you know, well, well, I can certainly understand what the strategy is getting at in terms of identifying China as, as something that, you know, poses potentially a long-term problem for the United States and more of a, more of a sense than Russia does. It seems pretty clear to me that Russia is kind of shaping the immediate problems facing the administration, um, at least in in Asia and Europe, more urgently than China is. Maybe I'm wrong here, but the war in Ukraine is just so obviously sort of the axis around which so many things spin that there, it seemed to me that there's kind of an interesting tension there. So Quint, I mean, I, I agree with you that the war in Ukraine, right, is the current hinge point, And it's hard to deny that. And yet, for all the obviousness of at least this part of this national security strategy, there does seem a way, and I'm curious, Scott, what your thoughts are on this, in, in which the Republicans are somehow signaling that they don't agree with this, right? So, you know, in recent days, there are some some suggestions and, and murmurs that if uh, the Republicans take the House, as they are likely to do in next month's midterm elections, you will see a uh, a, a pulling back of uh, military support to Ukraine. Now, you know, we'll see... We'll see if that in fact happens. But the fact that the Republicans are willing to sort of let that rumor float out there suggests that maybe they don't agree with the Biden administration's analysis of Russia as you know a key immediate threat to both the global system and America's interests that needs to be pushed back on. So I guess Scott, my question for you, for you is you know as as obvious as all three of us seem to think that at least that part of the national security strategy is. Is there maybe some value in the Biden administration putting it forward because maybe the Republicans don't actually agree? I mean, presumably Mitt Romney agrees, but he's been agreeing for long before it was fashionable to agree that Russia was a threat. But maybe the rest of the Republicans don't agree with him. So I do think there's a value to it, but I actually think that's not quite the value I see in it. Although that, that you may be right. I mean, we have to see what the Republican reaction, the Republican House's reaction, which frankly has a very different view of this stuff than the Republican Senate or a lot of different potential Republican administrations might in the future. But we'll have to see what, so how willing they are to push back on Ukraine assistance. Um, and a lot of that depends on, you know, the composition of that caucus. And, uh, you know, in the long term, I'd seem substantial that that would happen in the short term, I think much more limited. What I think is notable here is that they're really, the choice they're making here is to emphasize China, right? This would be a very easy moment for them to talk primarily about Ukraine. But instead they say, don't get distracted by Ukraine. China's the real challenge. 
And that actually is, I think, is pretty notable, a notable distinction. And that paragraph you read, Quinta, which I think is useful, highlights that a little bit, right? Like it is very easy to say Ukraine is the big focus. And frankly, maybe a more straightforward political message for the Biden administration to communicate, because it can say a lot of really good things about Ukraine right now. Uh, the fact that they've had a very successful campaign of backing the Ukrainians that seems to be successful in pushing back against Russia. And it makes, by the way, the Trump administration look like complete fools for the various engagements they had with Vladimir Putin, who now is, you know, a historical villain and is likely to go down that way and a failing one at that. Right. Um, so there's a lot of political reasons why maybe they would want to hit Ukraine harder. It's notable that they don't. Uh, and I actually think that's one of the more interesting parts of this is that they really kept this point of continuity. And this is true of the Biden administration generally, not just this document, but you really see it illustrated here from the Trump administration, which really always said China is the real concern. Now, the Trump administration said, let's not worry. Russia, we can be friends with. China is the real concern kind of over the course of this, particularly last year as an office. The Biden administration hasn't been willing to any, let Russia go, but it has been accepted that kind of ladder framing. And you really see that emphasized here. Frankly, there is probably more discussion of ways to balance China meaningfully in this than Russia. I think, at least more interesting substantive things. And so for that, that actually is a pretty interesting choice. And that's one of those like little insights you can get from documents like this, because you're getting a window into how the administration frames its own, would describe its own activities and priorities. It's always a mismatch. It's always a bit of a, a lengthy list. It doesn't always come together very well. Like I said, I'm not sure it's super effective for that purpose, but you do get a little glimpse of insight. I think that is one here. And notably here, very much unlike the Trump administration's national security strategy, where it was really shepherded by some key national security officials, but there's good reason to think that, frankly, the actual decision makers like President Trump, his senior advisors were not that engaged on it. It actually was a a, a document that leaned very heavily, for example, into international law and international order as ways to balance China and Russia, not unlike the strategy. And that is a message that was almost immediately repudiated by National Security Advisor John Bolton in UN speeches, like about a year after the strategy came out, a little less than a year. So, you know, it, it is it, it clearly did. Have, there's a disconnect between the people writing that report. And this one here, the fact that Jake Sullivan is the guy driving these policy decisions, advising the president, shaping the interagency process, and was the person who introduced this at an event at Georgetown. Very clearly, he's taking authorship for it. Implies this really does reflect like the White House is thinking on these things, and that that makes those little observations maybe more weighty than they might be otherwise. It's so Scott, among among the many buzzwords in this document is one that I know you think has some meaning, although it continues to be completely opaque to me. Please explain integrated deterrence. What on earth does this mean? Because it there is a, a handy little blue box on page 22 that explains it. And it mostly just sounds to me like doing deterrence, but it's Apparently, there is something new to it. Yeah. So this is, I think, a box you have to put in a little institutional memory to understand why it's actually saying something, I think, kind of significant here again. So you get a, you get a little better sense of it in potentially the Biden administration's national defense strategy, a kind of related sort of report here. But there was a kind of controversial move that the Trump administration did when it talked about deterrence, where it said essentially... They talked about similar sort of integrated deterrence. I think specifically they said cross-domain deterrence, which is one element of the integration the Biden administration talks about here. But they talk about, they essentially rolled nuclear deterrence into other port sorts of domains and said, basically, we're willing to use the nuclear deterrent to deter people across a variety of domains, including cyber and space and maritime and things like that. The reason that's significant is because the United States has, has particularly in the Obama administration, pretty much suggested that they were really were going to be extremely limited in how they're willing to use nuclear weapons, that they're not going to lean into the idea that the United States would, for example, use nuclear weapons as a first strike in response to a non-nuclear attack like a cyber attack. Well, when you're including nuclear as a tool in cross-domain deterrence, that is something that it actually does imply. Um, and the Trump administration that made some ruckus when it kind of made that statement, it was one of its kind of like moves. Here again, I think it's pretty much suggested that there's continuity here. Um, they, they mentioned that nuclear isn't the only thing they're going to rely on, but they don't distinguish nuclear from these other domains. And saying, instead, they're saying there's an integrated deterrence across a variety of domains, across a variety of capacities and regions in particular. One thing I do think it tries to do, though, is to make clear, look, deterrence is a really, really long multi-step ladder involving all sorts of tools. We're not going to be willing to just engage somebody on the nuclear terrain or the you know, mill to mill terrain. We're going to use economic tools, diplomatic tools, all sorts of range of tools to 
deter any sort of threat, whatever domain it comes across. They're very clearly trying to frame this as providing a more flexible toolkit and frankly, probably trying to tamp down some of the concerns about nuclear playing a really central role in a deterrence toolkit by saying we have all these other things. We're not trying to lean on nuclear too hard. We want to lean on this other stuff. At the same time, nuclear is part of this picture. And I I still kind of read this as a a suggestion here that they are not moving back towards uh, a strict rule saying, you know, nuclear weapons only in response to a, a nuclear attack, not in response to conventional attack, which was it has long been a policy position people have advocated for the Obama administration came very close to, but I don't believe ever expressly in books. I could be wrong about that, but I don't believe they ever did. So this kind of to me suggests no, we're not we're not binding ourselves that way. We're still viewing all of these as an integrated toolkit and nuclear is part of that. I wouldn't be surprised if like that's actually one of the things that's changed since February or January, whenever the first of these drafts was sort of circulated. Again, a lot of stuff about Russia descriptively is very different because the conflict's very different. But the only thing you basically get is like Russia's not quite, it's a little bit more of a paper tiger than we might have thought was the case early in the year or at the end of last year when the original draft is sort of circulated. But I'm not sure how much that changes what you do strategically. If Maybe you can lean forward a little bit more. But this might be a case where you're dealing with a very real nuclear threat in the case of Vladimir Putin in Ukraine. Frankly, again, it is probably the biggest nuclear crisis we've faced since the Cuban Missile Crisis, uh, as scary as that is, even though it's it's far away, so it's not, it doesn't feel quite perhaps as immediate as that crisis did. And the fact that you are, it means you have to be much more careful about how you frame your messaging around a nuclear deterrent. And I thought it was I read into this, maybe I'm reading too much into this, but I read into this uh, a deliberate effort to kind of keep options open around uh, nuclear items that I do think is notable, particularly in the context of the Ukraine conflict. Well, from a president finally rolling out a document that people have been asking for to another former president refusing to hand over documents or statements or anything to that effect that are desperately being sought of by Congress, at least so far, although we'll see. We've seen a na- notable development in the January 6th committee, perhaps the final notable development, at least we're likely to see for a little while. And that is that the January 6th committee, which held its last hearing last week, it's kind of, uh, you know, closing arguments uh, and last effort to bring forward some interesting last tidbits it's gathered in the last few weeks since its last closing session, its last real closing argument, closed its proceedings by holding a vote on whether or not to subpoena former President Trump for testimony regarding his actions in relation to January 6th, and they voted unanimously to do so. So a subpoena presumably will be issuing uh, in the near future to that effect. Quentin, let me turn to you for this first. Tell us a little bit, you know, what do we think is the logic behind the committee being willing to do this, taking this step that certainly puts itself in a more confrontational posture with former President Trump, I think would be fair to say, than it's openly adopted so far, at least in terms of like uh, him personally and getting input from him. Why would it be taking this step now? And what does it mean for former President Trump? Are, are there realistic prospects of enforcement in this sort of request? Or is this really much more of a shot across the bow in a political messaging battle with him regarding the activities of the committee? So I'll start by plugging a podcast that I recorded this morning. So that's Tuesday morning that will be available to listeners of this show on Wednesday. So the day that you're listening to this with uh, Molly Reynolds, Jonathan Schaub and and Ben Wittes, um, which is a trio of heavy hitters, Molly on the congressional side, Jonathan on the DOJ Office of Legal Counsel side and Ben on the Trump investigation side, sort of talking through what we should expect here. And after recording that, my takeaway is really that, uh, and I'll channel Molly here, I think the sort of easiest explanation for why this is happening now is that the committee finally got to a place where all the members could agree unanimously that they wanted to do it. Um, The committee has been very careful about taking actions unanimously. I can't think of a single thing that they've done that hasn't been unanimous, kind of as a, you know, political positioning issue. And so we know there'd been reporting that certain members of the committee were thinking about subpoenaing Trump, you know, uh, as far back as as maybe six months ago or so. Others were skeptical. So seemingly we've gotten to a point where they could get everybody on board. The stated reason during the hearing was essentially that, you know, they'd found out as much as they could without speaking to him, but that because of the insistence of those around him on stonewalling, uh, pleading the fifth, otherwise not providing information, they just kind of hit a point where they felt that they needed to hear directly from the man himself. 
uh, hence the subpoena. I think there's very much an open question about what happens next. So we we haven't seen the subpoena, so we don't know what specifically they're asking for, how broad the request goes, whether it's for testimony or for documents as well. I find it difficult to imagine that Trump will actually end up testifying before the committee just because, you know, he for months during the Mueller investigation, all he would do was yammer about how badly he wanted to testify before Mueller. um, And he he never did it, strangely. And so I would imagine that the same dynamic is going to be in play here, that he'll talk about how he really, really wants to talk to the committee and that it just mysteriously somehow won't happen. So the big question in my mind then is, you know, what happens next? I would imagine that the committee would vote in a contempt resolution and the full house would hold him in contempt. Then it goes to the Justice Department. And I think there's really an open question about what DOJ will do. Uh, one point that that Jonathan made, um, who is formerly at OLC, is that the Office of Legal Counsel takes a very robust view of what it calls testimonial immunity. So the ability of the president and close presidential advisors to essentially just refuse to show up uh, to testify before Congress. President Truman pointed to this idea and refusing to testify before uh, the House on American Activities Committee after leaving the presidency. And Jonathan's point was that Trump could very well make the same argument here and that OLC might consider, you know, we have we have set out in our office's work this idea of testimonial immunity. We can't prosecute this guy uh, for abiding by that, essentially. And then I think you end up in a potentially very damaging situation where the committee has held Trump in contempt for not abiding by the subpoena and the Justice Department has kind of shrugged and said, hey, man, that's the brakes. You know, what can you do? So we'll see. Maybe I'm being overly cynical. Maybe DOJ will take the opportunity to think a little more creatively. It's hard to know. Yeah, I, I Quinta, that was a great overview. And I, I agree with everything Quinta said. And I just want to separate two issues. One is, will Trump testify? And if he doesn't, will DOJ prosecute him for it? And the answer I think, to both of those questions is, for the reasons Quinta explained, no and no. And that's a separate question from, was it the right thing for the committee to subpoena Trump? And there, I think the answer is yes, right? Because a lot of what happened, you know, a lot of the criminal case against Trump hinges on his state of mind and the specific things that he did. And he should be forced to to testify to that. Now, if he wants to plead the fifth, he can do that. But then he should be forced to plead the fifth. And he, you know, is a, f- a former president, obviously. But that doesn't mean that he, you know, whatever OLC says should have this full testimonial immunity. And so, you know, if the conclusion here is that Congress did its job, it tried to use its its powers, and DOJ, you know, unfortunately has made it such that Trump has a good argument against it, then I think that'll highlight uh, the need for maybe some OLC reform, because as we can see the the second order consequences of of aggressive claims of presidential power are not always uh, are not always so good. So so I, I just want to emphasize just two things can be true at the same time, right, which is that Trump will not testify. And also it was the right thing to do to issue a subpoena to get him to testify. Yeah, to be clear, I I completely agree. I think that there there is a great value of of in taking this step, and I I will uh, never be one not to second a call for reforming how OLC thinks about these things. Alan, I, I definitely agree with your second prompt regarding whether DOJ will prosecute. I'm less a little bit convinced to the first one. For the second one, I think we already have an answer to this, right? Because DOJ has already declined to prosecute Mark Meadows, right? Well, the but this the Meadows the Meadows situation was was relatively different. I I think that there there are enough, you know, distinct elements that it's not necessarily clear. But how would it be distinct? Because essentially with Meadows, you had a subpoena where his biggest, the most credible line of defense, the one we're assuming the Justice Department was persuaded by, was his proximity to the White House, right? That's really the only argument he had as to why he couldn't be compelled to do a lot of this stuff, particularly from his time as chief of staff. I don't think any of it touched on his time with Congress where he'd have his separate arguments. And so if, every, if his whole argument about why I can't be prosecuted for this stuff is, or for not disclosing this information is because, hey, I'm close to this president seems like it would extend here. Now, the only I guess the one factor is the fact they did like partially cooperate, right? Uh, and that muddies the waters a little bit. And I do think that was kind of a little bit of the line that DOJ was trying to draw a little bit in that at least he could have a colorable argument that he had tried to act in some degree of good faith of accommodation. But 
that strikes me as maybe the fuzzier line here. If you're accepting that Meadows has any sort of ground to stand on, it seems like the president, the hub, the core, the sun around which that privilege orbits would have just an infinitely stronger argument. Are there other factors that would distinguish it more, do you think? Right. I think the the issue in the Meadows case, as you say, is the fact that Meadows did cooperate to some extent before he decided to kind of back away. Um, whereas I would imagine, you know, if if Trump took uh, approach of total stonewalling, which is frankly kind of what I expect here, that that on the surface would look, uh, setting aside the testimony immun- immunity question, might look a lot more like the Bannon case where the DOJ and the judge and jury in the case basically said, like, look, like you at no point did you ever attempt to cooperate with the committee. You you just completely stonewalled them. Or maybe more like Peter Navarro, who was a White House official, but still faced an indictment at some point, right? Right. Although Navarro, I think Navarro's case is very much shaped by the fact that he didn't actually hire a lawyer at any point and so was really uh, flying blind and perhaps did not serve himself as well as he as he might have. But yeah, I, I don't know, right? And I, I definitely think that, you know, the fact that we have the Bannon prosecution on the one hand, that does show that DOJ is willing to, you know, kind of go all in if somebody does just stonewall. But we also have the decision not to prosecute Meadows. And that does speak, I I think you're you're correct, to the the fact that there are absolutely circumstances in which DOJ will say, you know, look, this is just not something we're going to go for. Uh, let me go back to that other prompt, because the legal prosecution question is is there. But really, like, the realistically, before DOJ could make a decision or try anything, if the Republicans win the House, the subpoena is going to go away, right? Because they'll disband the committee, strict the subpoena. And so it's not even really a question we're probably going to get an answer to. Real question is, will Trump do it? Because I think Trump's really unpredictable. I don't know if you've heard. I think he makes sometimes some self-defeating decisions. Uh, and in particular, has made some in that I think he's in a moment now where people around him are less able to restrain him than he used to. So are we so confident that he won't take the bait? And particularly, let's say that they meet the conditions that supposedly he's talked about in the past, where they say, yeah, come do it live on television. Will he be able to say no to that? I don't think he's going to do it. I think I think Trump, for all his wackiness and lack of control, has uh, respect is not the right word. He understands what perjury is. I mean, I think he understands what it is to testify under oath. He has been a minor crime boss for he, he was a minor crime boss for many decades before he became a major crime boss. And throughout this time, he was surrounded by lawyers. And it, when the moment came to make fundamentally an adult decision with respect to not lying under oath. I think he tended to be pretty good at that. I, I don't know. I don't know why. But I mean, I think, again, if you know, if you look, for example, at uh, his willingness to take the fifth, right, uh, in the New York State Attorney General inquiry, like he, he, he knows how to do it. He can do it. I don't know how grudging he is when he does it. But I, I, I think that, you know, somewhere deep down inside his his reptile brain is like a, a tripwire or something where where he understands that that uh, he can he he cannot literally lie under oath. Um, yeah. And so I, I just I don't think he'll do it. I don't he'll to be clear, he'll he'll lie not under oath, <laughs> like he'll lie on truth social and stuff like that. And on at a rally, I just I don't think he's gonna go and sit in that chair and swear and then and then lie. Yeah, I agree. I also, I highly doubt that the committee would give him the opportunity to come in and testify live in public. They were given that opportunity before Stuart Rhodes, the leader of the Oath Keepers, offered to come in and testify live and said that that was the only way that he would testify. And they said, you know, nice try. Good TV, man. Yeah, they've been heavily, heavily choreographed. Um, in all of the witnesses that they've brought up, they've brought only friendly witnesses, the sort of potentially not friendly witnesses they have shown only through videotapes of depositions. I just don't think that they would allow that wild card. Um, and one one point that I should make clear also is if there is a contempt uh, finding against Trump by by the House, I mean, I would imagine that what they would do is they would vote it out and pass it to the Justice Department before the end of this Congress uh, so that it would be in the hands of DOJ. And again, encourage everybody to go listen to the to our podcast that we recorded this morning. There's not really anything that a Republican House can do at that point. It's really just up to, to DOJ, even if Kevin McCarthy somehow figures out some way to say, you know, aha, we've magically uncontempted you. Uh, that doesn't really have any 
sway at this point. So I think the, you know, the, the ace in the hole to the extent that the committee has one is that as of, you know, when the new Congress shows up, even if it's under Republican control, Merrick Garland's still going to be the attorney general. Which is good because Merrick Garland doesn't have enough things on his plate. They're just he does not have enough weighty decisions to make. It's good. Let's just just add it's chill. another. It's chill. It's all chill. The vibes are good. I mean, that's actually a big question to me, though, because I don't understand why referring this to DOJ would be in the to the benefit of, frankly, the committee or the Justice Department, uh, right, uh, or anybody else, you know, except maybe in some weird way, Trump. Because essentially, you get to a point where the Justice Department is seems very unlikely to want to do this. The optics of them moving forward with the prosecution when the current House has no interest in the testimony and there's no way for Trump to th- at that point comply seems very low to me. No, but, but this is this is criminal contempt. It's not civil contempt. This is, you know- Oh, no, this, no, I understand. That, right, so there, you're, you can't cure the contempt. But they are no longer seeking this to subpoena him at that point, that the the crime has been committed. The crime is not testifying. So it doesn't matter that the new House isn't seeking the information. No, I totally understand. I totally understand legally the optics of when the Speaker of the House is passing House resolutions saying this is an improper prosecution. We have no interest in this testimony. The committee's been disbanded, disowning all of its work and actively undermining its legacy. Uh, I think is a bad one and one that makes it a lot harder for the Justice Department to pursue, and it puts the onus on them being willing to take on that political cost. And it's at a moment where the Justice Department, A, has lots of other weighty decisions that it has to make, and B, lots of other avenues of bringing legal action against former President Trump, let alone for testimony that nobody's interested in anymore. So it strikes me it's kind of a weird step. That's why like, it makes much more sense to me as a game of chicken with Trump, a bait for Trump, or maybe just a pure messaging thing saying, we are giving Trump his opportunity to make his side of the story. Let's see if he takes it. Then actually any sort of scheme to actually see this thing enforced or bring legal consequences against Trump for not complying. Well, that's, I mean, I think that's why to Alan's point, you have to see those two things as different components of the the larger picture, right? Like, I do think that it's important for the committee to be able to say, we ran this down to the end of the line as far as we could possibly take it, right? And it also, frankly, it allows them to, with, with the midterms coming up, not that January 6th has been a huge issue with the midterms, but it allows them to go and say, do you want to see Trump held accountable or not? Because, you know, if if McCarthy comes in, he's going to be undermining this effort, even though, as, as we've said, legally, that doesn't have any significance. So, you know, if they want that messaging, they can have it. I do think that it is symbolically important for them to be able to say, we pushed this as far as we could possibly take it. Now, I suppose you could take it even further and say, you know what? We're going to exercise inherent contempt. We're going to lock Donald Trump up in no framework uh, conference statute. room. No, no actual way to do it without the You know what? Leroy Jenkins, just go for it. I think that they <laughs> should just go all the way here. You know, the civil enforcement is going to take forever. We don't know if DOJ will prosecute. Just go for it. Yeah, I don't know. I I I I think the politics around the decision. I get why people deliberate it for so long, right? Like, because I think it's actually a tricky call from the committee's part about how this plays in their favor and and not in their favor. To me, the one factor that makes me think it might it makes it maybe have a little more sense is the fact that like Trump may be compelled to take the. I don't think that he'll actually like show up and testify and I don't think they'll actually give him like open reign, but it invites things like this 14 page response letter we got, which is unhinged and does not help the public record or his you know attitude on it at all. And I will say I'm like less confident that he's as restrained as you guys are like the MAL Mar-a-Lago controversy, which has arisen entirely of his own creation after leaving the White House entirely because he doesn't have anyone around him willing to tell him no. And in fact, he has a bunch of sycophants willing to do exactly what he tells them to do, even when, for example, signing affidavits to the FBI about what records they do and don't have based on his personal direction, which, by the way, was him committing perjury. Uh, We haven't quite gotten there, or at least obstruction of justice. Like, it's going to get there eventually. Like, it's not that that hard a case to make once we make clear that he's the one who gave directions about what the content of these records are. So I'm not convinced that he's got those external mechanisms in place anymore like he used to have when he was in the administration that would have pushed back firmly enough to actually dissuade him. Um, but but I, I kind of think maybe he will not want to do it himself. He may want to do it on his own terms and take the invitation to send some sort of message on his own through his own outlets. Well, from mixed signals to signals intelligence, thank you to Scott for that one. It's pronounced one. signals intelligence. Signals. And I thought that that was a good joke. I was pleased with myself <laughs> for that one personally. I think that is pretty funny. Yeah, 
So on October 7th, President Biden signed an executive order that had to do with Signals Intelligence. Uh, specifically, it's titled Executive Order on Enhancing Safeguards for United States Signals Intelligence Activities. Um, and this is the latest salvo in an extremely long running back and forth between the U.S. and the EU about privacy protections for transatlantic data. It is... Uh, was signed after the Court of Justice for the European Union struck down a 2015 agreement known as Privacy Shield for failing to protect individual privacy rights. And so this order, it ha- there are a lot of details. I think it's fair to say that the sort of the high level overview is that it limits SIGINT collection to certain legitimate objectives for which SIGINT can be collected. And it also provides a mechanism by which uh, certain qualifying states, uh, so those are uh, states that will, I believe, be designated by the attorney general, can essentially submit complaints um, if they're unhappy with how the United States has been going about things. I think uh, it makes sense to say that the, the sort of top line here is that this is generally trying to put a little more framework on signal collection and also provide more protections for non-U.S. person data. Alan, can you give us a little bit of a sense of what the long and tortured emphasis on tortured backstory is here? Yeah, no, uh, this is this is a real mess. So the the real problem, I think, is is that there is there's a set of mismatches and tensions between Europe and the United States with regards to data collection, foreign intelligence, and privacy. And, and I'm just going to list a, a couple of them. And then they interact in interesting ways. So one of the tensions is that the United States and Europe just have different conceptions of privacy. And oversimplifying very broadly, the Europeans tend to take a more, say, harder line on privacy intrusions. Um, they they tend to take the kind of right to privacy a little more seriously than Americans do, and therefore they are in some ways somewhat more allergic to, you know, surveillance than Americans are. In addition, Europe has to do less signals intelligence uh, because just geopolitically they exist kind of under the umbrella of the U.S. security apparatus, so it is somewhat easier for them to take the high road on surveillance because a lot of their surveillance needs are actually back channeled to them uh, by the United States itself, uh, which is a little ironic and underappreciated. And then the third uh, thing uh, is that there's actually a really big split between Europe and the constituent members of the European Union, which is to say a lot of these statements, a lot of these negotiations, a lot of these court judgments are done by organs of the European Union. But the actual member state intelligence collection bodies, like the people who actually do intelligence collection for France and Germany, are just as aggressive and frankly, sometimes more aggressive than the United States are. And so there's like a little bit of a left-hand, right-hand situation. Um, you know, in the United States, we don't have this problem because all issues related to foreign intelligence surveillance are just dealt with by the federal government. Um, whereas in Europe, you have this weird mismatch where the actual surveilling is done by nations but a lot of the angry rhetoric about how bad surveillance is is done by the European Union. Um, so, so you can end up with these odd mismatches. Uh, and, and then finally, you have the situation where the main piece of leverage that Europe has is that it's a huge economic market, in particular for American companies. And American companies that want to do business in Europe have to take European data and bring it back to America for processing. You know, If you're, uh, for example, Google, it's just easier for you to do all your computation and data collection and storage in California and have in those databases, not just American user data, but also European user data. So this, again, creates just a lot of of tensions. Uh, And so one way of trying to deal with that has been these sets of agreements between Europe and the United States, where basically the Europeans say, and particularly the, the European Union institutions say, it is a fundamental human right that all Europeans must recognize and respect that all people have their privacy respected. And then for a while, the way that America, Europe allowed American companies to take information from Europe and put it in America was that American companies would self-certify that they were complying. Everyone kind of knew that that was false. 
because everyone knew that American companies were doing things that the European companies, Europe didn't want them to do, but we were all sort of okay with I that. I just want to say this. Yeah, you're describing an extremely functional system. Here. Yeah, it's completely bizarre. But then Snowden happened, and then it became very hard for everyone to keep pretending like that was going on. And so then you had the Schrems decision, and he actually uh, sued in Ireland for reasons I just, it's not, I don't even, I, I, I can't even. But the conclusion was that the European relevant European court said, actually, this fiction is no longer good and we can't keep ignoring it. And so since then, there's been all these attempts to uh, rethread the needle, as it were. And this is the latest, latest attempt. And the question is, is this going to be enough? Is this going to be enough to satisfy Europe that the American regime is sufficiently rights protective that we can sort of paper over the differences? And there, the answer is kind of hard to say. The, the United States can negotiate these standards with the Europeans as much as they want. But ultimately, if the European courts are going to be the final word on this um, and they're not involved in these negotiations, they can blow it up at any moment. You know, the thing I would say, you know, reading this this new executive order, and there's a, there's a nice lawfare post uh, that we'll link to that, that summarizes it. A lot of it actually just returns us to the Obama status quo. One of the notable features of, of the Obama administration was that they recognized, I think for the first time in American history, that foreigners, right, non-people outside the United States, actually have privacy interests that the U.S. intelligence community ought to respect whenever possible. Now, that's not a very strong constraint because it's always, you know, whenever feasible with respect to American intelligence priorities, et cetera, et cetera. But at least rhetorically, it pointed out that it actually, you know, if possible, don't impede on people's privacy rights. Um, then you had obviously four years of Trump and Trump, administration was just like often a big F you to the rest of the world. Um, so a lot of what the Biden, this executive order is doing, I think is, is reaffirming often using like the exact same language as some of the Obama administration executive orders, this new nicer posture. What is interesting, I think, and I'll be very, very curious to see how this develops is this court that uh, the executive order sets up, which is supposed to be you know, made up by experts in national security law and, you know, outside the government and they come together. It's it's almost like the, I don't know, when I first read it, it, it's like, oh, it's like the Facebook Supreme Court for, for the intelligence community. But it's only for this very narrow question of adjudicating disputes that nations that the United States gives this privilege to, which is basically going to be these Western European nations at first. It's going to adjudicate their complaints. And I think what's going to be interesting to see is, A, how this works, you know, whether um, this court really will be independent or independent enough to satisfy the Europeans. And then finally, and most interestingly, whether it its jurisdiction will extend over time beyond just this. Um, because at the same time as you have this court, you still have the PCLOB, right? The President's Civil Liberty and Oversight Board, which does play kind of a general oversight role here. And so one can imagine, you know, turf wars between these, these two uh, over time. But that's sort of the sort of the long and my apologies, somewhat uh, convoluted background to where we are today. It's convoluted because it really is remarkably convoluted. Yeah, I just have to say the, these disputes. I remember trying to get a handle on them when I started at Lawfare in 2015, 2016, and it is mildly astonishing to me that we have gotten basically nowhere since then. Well, we've gone lots of places, and then we keep ending back at the same place. <laughs> so it's not that it's we so haven't strong. gone nowhere. It's so we've gone lots of places, it's, but we can't get anywhere. It's, in the it's long like run. Uh, it's like jogging. It's like how Anchorman defined jogging: you run and you run, and you you never you never get anywhere. Here you go. Exactly. I you know I think this is a really interesting debate, but it really reflects like a fundamental problem that exists in discussion of surveillance technologies generally, and frankly, a lot of the national security space even beyond that, which is that it it kind of fundamentally comes down to the sense of trustworthiness of like national security decision makers and policy makers, really. Um, like we set up these apparatuses, like particularly like this executive order, right? Where you say, oh no, well, here are these 12 criteria we need to be weighing and making collection decisions. Here's all sorts of internal constraints we're going to set up. But as you've already noted, they're broadly worded. They're a little vague. You only buy the extent to which you they are actually going to be effective based on how in good faith you think the executive branch is going to try and comply and implement them. And so like that you know, strikes me as that particular problem. I think I'm skeptical as it sounds like you are, Alan, of like those really being the make or break of this particular case. This redress mechanism is interesting because you're trying to set up 
procedures where you have some degree of independence within the executive branch, right? Like you're bringing in outside kind of adjudicators who supposedly have a little more committed to civil liberties, kind of building a little bit on a, a, a peacock parallel sort of model. And it's, it's interesting. And like you have some degree of institutional autonomy there, but it's still rooted in the executive branch. And perhaps most importantly here, it's rooted in executive order meaning it's not something that is like beyond the ability of any future president to simply reverse, potentially even in ways, depending on how you interpret the bindings of executive orders, in ways that may not be publicly apparent. And, you know, I I am remain concerned that like Europeans aren't going to find this satisfactory and that if not necessarily because of the failures of the shortcoming, but the, because of the fact that it is still very much embedded in our executive branch, which has lost so much of its credibility after the Snowden scandal uh, and a lot of, uh, and for among many other reasons, uh, you know, that is not the, the, the sole uh, straw that broke the camel's back in this particular case. Um, but if you don't fundamentally trust the executive branch to at least abide by its own words about things, then even an executive order setting forth a pretty independent review process probably isn't going to be necessarily that persuasive. I wonder whether you will need legislation to do more of these things. And that's not something that appears to exist in this case, although maybe that's that's down the road, something that the administration is willing to pursue. Yeah. And, and just to just to follow up on that, he, here's where I think the conflict between the European Union institutions, which take a very kind of high-minded view of privacy, and the actual member states' security services, which cannot afford to take quite as high-minded a view of privacy, that's where this gets kind of complicated. Because, of course, in, in, in a normal situation, the United States would have like one party to negotiate with, right? And they would say, well, here, here are some guarantees. We're going to try not to spy on your citizens too much, but we're going to spy as much as we want to. And if you don't want us to, well, then you don't get to benefit from the amount of spying we do. And then you guys just choose, right? That's how it works in the real world. But here you can't quite do that because the like the European Court of Justice or, or whoever the kind of final decision maker is, is just not the same constituency that cares about, for example, all the help and intelligence collection that America does for European nations. Uh, and so the, I think the really interesting question is in that triangle, right, where you have the United States, the European institutions, and the European countries and their security services, what is the interaction happening? And this is what I want to know. I don't have any visibility into this. What's happening between the European, like, like the chief, like Germany's chief spy, right? And the European Union institutions, because if I was Germany's chief spy, I would tell the European institutions, you guys have to back off because like, if you guys keep pushing this issue, then we, right, the Germans and the French and the Italians and our spy agencies are going to lose access to American data and like we don't we don't want that but i'm not sure what the mechanism is for dealing with that intra-european dispute that that to me is the really interesting question i mean i would also wonder to what extent if at all the war in ukraine sh is shaping this right because there's been just a ton of reporting about how crucially important u.s signals intelligence has been to the ukrainian war effort in terms of sharing information with Ukraine and with other European partners. So it's not like a, you know, an abstract, you know, what if there was a bomb and we needed to know because it, it was on a timer, right? That garbage. Um, like there is an actual war going on. There are examples that you can read in the paper because the intelligence agencies are telling reporters about them that show how important this material is. I, again, precisely because of the reasons that you identify, Alan, I have no idea if the European Court of Human Rights cares about that, but it does seem like it, it makes the standoff sort of more urgent potentially. And just to be clear, I'm not trying to, I mean, I, I, I feel like I, I worry that I'm coming across as ragging on the you know, European Court of Human Rights. Like it's not their job, right? They, they were set up to adjudicate human rights issues according to a framework that they were told to use and that they believe is true. So of course, that's what they are going to do, right? The, the, the problem is whether the people who built out this framework of having kind of human rights adjudication done at one level, but actual surveillance at policy and activity done at another level, if that system works over, over the long term here. That's, that's I think, the issue.
Just one point of clarification for folks. The actual Schrems II judgment was from the Court of Justice of the European Union, not the European Court of Human Rights. So different jurisdictional lines. Too many lines, courts. Foundational many courts. laws. There are a lot of courts in Europe uh, with, with very complex jurisdictional lines. But I think the basic logic is still there, is that this this the mandates and the conception of the court's relationship responsibilities is very different when you're talking about a supranational body that's established by treaties and that whose main, you know, mandate really relates to the enforcement of treaties that have very express and well articulated rights provisions. And then in this case has also the, you know, GDPR and implementing legislation adopted that feeds into that and reinforces that in some ways, versus against the often much more hard to define and hard to articulate national interests of the national security apparatus within individual member states, right? And and this is this is, a, this is a problem that we see domestically all the time in terms of how do you, as national security agencies, actually articulate those interests. And it is genuinely very easy for them to overstate those interests in a way that is not provable. That is what most, I think, skeptics of the national security state would say is happening all the time. But is that happening on a kind of international level? I will say just one more angle on this too. I think there's just a fundamentally different understanding uh, that I'm worried is going to play into the perception of this about between parliamentary governments and our government in terms of the role that legislation plays versus executive branch action. Um, you know, in European systems and lots of global systems, most global systems where it's parliamentary forms of government, you don't have the separation of powers between the branches like we have, where they're often controlled by separate parties. And you don't have a parliament that's actually designed basically to be super small C conservative like we have in the United States. Instead, you have parliaments that are controlled by the same people who run the government. And the idea is that you can have pretty reactive legislation. They actually can enact laws to address national policy problems. Imagine that. Seems like a crazy idea to us in America, where we have a Congress and a broader institutional apparatus specifically designed to make enacting national legislation actually pretty hard. And that's why we rely so much on the administrative state, something that's very controversial domestically as kind of a democratic deficit argument. And I think also is sometimes viewed as people outside the United States system don't fully comprehend how essential it is. So when the executive branch is doing things in regards to regs and reinforcement, you know, a lot of executive branch action actually can be genuinely constraining on the executive branch, particularly where there's judicial review, the Administrative Procedure Act, things like that, where there's these pressure points. A lot of those then go away, though, in the national security space. Uh, and that even for people who are maybe a little more engaged with the system makes it I don't know, maybe not as persuasive as actually a check is actually providing guarantees and safeguards. Um, again, I, and I'm worried this is going to be a, a point of tension. That said, I, I am cautiously optimistic, at least that having moved a number of years past the Snowden controversy now, having reinforced through Ukraine and other events, the benefits of a major US-European intelligence cooperation relationship, and frankly, being in a moment where Europe is much more under threat than it has been uh, for the last 10 or 20 years in the fact that you have a Russia that is pretty openly um, in a belligerent stance towards it makes me think those those broader dynamics, no court is immune to those, um, including those in the European Union, that, that may face them feeling some more pressure to find a solution a little more proactively here. But we'll have to wait and see. Well, folks, that is all the time we have for today, but this would not be rational security if we did not leave you with some object lessons to ponder on over the course of your week. Alan, why don't you go ahead and get us started? Yeah, so my object lesson is a recent uh, film that came out. It's called Vesper. Uh, it's a post-apocalyptic sci-fi movie out of Europe. Uh, so like uh, many European movies, it is slow-paced and very depressing, uh, but it is also excellent. It, 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 you know, you got the, you got the, the standard post-apocalyptic thing. You have sort of the, the, the kind of, you know, really smart 13 year old girl protagonist who is a whiz at the only technology that matters, which is genetic engineering, you know, things happen. It's incredibly beautiful. It's incredibly atmospheric. Um, it's very impressive to see a relatively low budget indie film with such amazing world building. Uh, including visually, right? Because that usually takes a lot of money. Uh, and I think it is uh, it is very cool that I think um, CGI has gotten to the point where it is relatively inexpensive to produce even incredibly high quality CGI, which I think is really good for sci-fi nerds like me who want more, better world building based rather than just action sci-fi. You know, I, I feel like there's enough in there for seven seasons of a premiere television show. And it's too bad that we only got 90 minutes of television. Um, but if you want a beautiful, somewhat disturbing, really provocative sci-fi movie to watch. Uh, Vesper is the movie for you.
Ooh, I like it. I'm excited to check this out. I had not, this had not passed my radar, but having just Googled it, it looks very much up my alley. Quinto, what do you have to share with us this week? I would like to share an absolute ethering of uh, Senator Ben Sass, soon to be the University of Florida's new president, by Carlos Lozada, who was formerly the Washington Post's book critic and is now a opinion writer at the New York Times. It, it is an opinion column, and it begins, Among the hundreds of books I read during my years as a critic for the Washington Post, only three proved so paralyzingly pointless that upon reading the last page, I found I had nothing to say. Uh, and you will not be surprised to learn that one of those three books was a book by none other than Senator Ben Sass. Sass is, is kind of a uniquely frustrating figure because he holds himself out as, you know, a thoughtful conservative. Uh, you know, he he listens to all arguments. He weighs both sides. Um, and yet, or perhaps because of that, he has managed to be just completely substantiveless and a non-entity. And I very much enjoyed Lazada's just absolute destruction of him in this op-ed. So if you, like me, have found Ben Sass unbelievably frustrating, I highly recommend this column. I will just say, I get the dunking about all of this, and there's no universe in which Ben Sass should be like a university president. However, um, I think people do not appreciate that given Florida's politics right now and what they are doing to the university, the only way in which that university survives as anything like a world-class university, which is what they spent a long time trying to do before DeSantis decided to rip it all down, is to have a Republican politician in charge. And so like, I get the mockery. I totally do. But I think people are really misunderstanding uh, the, only, the only way that the University of Florida will survive. I think the problem is is that that depends on SAS actually having principles as opposed to just, you know, adopting the pose of the thinker as he slides gradually into the swamp. You know, he vo- he voted he voted to to convict Donald Trump at least one time. So that makes that puts him already three standard <laughs> deviations to the right of the vast majority of his co co-politicals. Well, for my object lessons this week, I will share that I am, as some people know, for my sins, a graduate of that most controversial of institutions, the Yale Law School. Uh, (laughs) The Yale Law School. A very beloved and genuinely great man is celebrating his 90th birthday today, and I'm going to give him a tribute, and that is Mr. Judge, sir, pardon me, Judge, the Honorable Guido Calabresi, uh, my once and for and f- and forever torts professor, um, and I will share two stories about Guido that I love because he's a normal man. I do not have a close relationship with him. I'm not sure I've talked to him in ten years, but he was always just so delightful, and I have great affection for him. Uh, and I will share these two during my torts class, which was very early in the morning, my one L year. He very excitedly, he's a very animated man at this point, already about eighty years old, if not past eighty, uh, was jumping around very excitedly and ate it on the steps of our tiered uh, kind of like arena type classroom and fell on the store floor and I think genuinely may have, been, may have been knocked unconscious, was like out for like a solid 10 seconds. And the whole class stood up shocked. Like, oh my God, did we, did we just see the death of a, of a legal lion here? It was like our first week of law school. And in fact, he popped right back up, pointed to the student whose backpack he had tripped on and said, that's a tort. You'll learn about that next week. And went right back to teaching, which was just amazing. Uh, and then he also, at the end of that semester, I went to go visit him in office hours just to talk to him. I didn't really get to know him. It was an early class. I was always very sleepy and maybe didn't make it 100% of the time. And I uh, went to ask him for life advice. And he spent like 45 minutes talking to me about the importance of life and giving this advice that is the absolute most Italian advice I think he would take great pride in that I've ever had, by which I mean it was surprisingly sexualized in a kind of endearing, uh, strange way that in some ways, like your grandfather might have a chat with you. You're like, this went in a weird direction, grandpa. That was this experience. Uh, but it was all about capturing your passions and finding something you love. Uh, and it is something I have reflected on over the course of my very unorthodox legal career, during which I have genuinely pursued things that interest me above all else. Uh, and I have not regretted it one moment. And uh, Professor Calabrese, Judge Calabrese, deserves a lot credit for that for better or for worse we'll see how it turns out we don't but regardless at this moment in my life i really appreciate it uh and i want to give him a tribute on his 90th birthday uh which is which will be tomorrow for those of you listening when this comes out but it's today when we are recording happy birthday guido well with that that brings us to the end of this week's episode but remember that Rational Security 2.0 is like its forebear, a production of Lawfare. So be sure to visit us at lawfareblog.com for our show page with links to past episodes, for our written work, the written work of other Lawfare contributors, and for information on Lawfare's other phenomenal podcast series. Also, be sure to follow us on Twitter at RATL Security and be sure to leave a rating or review wherever you might be listening. 
Also, be sure to sign up to become a material supporter of Lawfare on Patreon at patreon.com slash lawfare for an ad-free version of this podcast, among many other special benefits. Our audio engineer producer this week was Kara Schillen of Go Rodeo, and our music, as always, was performed by Sophia Yan, and we are once again edited by the wonderful Jeff Katja Howell. On behalf of my co-host, Madden Allen, I am Scott R. Anderson, and we'll talk to you next week. Until then, goodbye. <laughs>